Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the uh, 2018 Environmental Speaker Series. Uh, we're really excited to have so many people here in McLean, too. This is one of the first major events at this location, uh, as well as a ton of folks joining us online via Zoom and at viewing parties across the company. So first off, before we introduce our speakers, I want to talk to you a little bit about Green Solutions this year. We've had an outstanding year, and I want to bring a couple highlights to you. So first, um, we just joined RE100. We joined 144 other leading global companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, publicly recommitting ourselves and to 100% renewable energy. We have set several new environmental goals. We have recently achieved carbon neutrality as a company. We've committed to reduce scope three emissions 25% by 2025. And we have set a goal to reduce the landfill waste of our large campuses 50% by 2025. You can also learn more about all this stuff. <laughs> big deal, pretty big deal. So Thursday night, we launch our new external facing sustainability web pages for the company. So you can go to environment.capitalone.com Friday morning and learn a lot more about all this stuff. So a couple housekeeping things, first off. After our presenters speak, there will be a Q&A with participation from the audience, as well as taking questions online via Zoom, um, as well in Slack with hashtag Green Solutions. Once we're done with the Q&A, please don't jump out of your seats yet because we have a really exciting announcement about next year's speaker that you're going to want to hear. And then after that, those of you here in McLean can go outside for a reception and a meet and greet with our present presenters. So a little bit about the speaker series. Um, Environmental Speaker Series is designed to bring leading global thought leaders for our associates to hear from and learn a bit about topics that are important to the health and well-being of our planet. What we hope is that you guys will be inspired by this and want to become more involved in the Capital One Sustainability Program as well as programs within your own communities. Uh, and now with that, I'd like to introduce Alexandra Cousteau. So, you may be familiar with her last name. She is the granddaughter of explorer Jacques Cousteau, uh, but she's very much forged her own path. Uh, Alexander is a filmmaker with over 100 award-winning short films on environmental issues around the world. National Geographic has named her an emerging explorer, and she's a globally recognized expert in water policy and an advocate for conservation. So with that, please welcome to the stage Alexander Cousteau. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Happy to be here. Um, well, I'm happy to be here. Let me see. Yeah. So um, I wanted to start with a story about the first time that I really forged a connection with the oceans. My parents taught me to, die, uh, to, to swim when I was six months old. And I was water safe by the time I was a year. You could throw me in. I'd swim to the side, no problem. But when my grandfather decided it was time for me to dive, I was seven years old, we went out in a boat in the south of France, in the Mediterranean, and he had brought equipment with him for me to wear. And I was kind of a tall, skinny, gangly seven-year-old, and the mask was kind of big. The regulator that he brought hung heavily in my mouth. He had a little uh, tank on red rubber suspenders that kept slipping off my shoulder. And he brought some flippers with him, which were too big. So I was all kitted out. And I walked up to the edge. And I looked down into this really dark, murky ocean. And I thought, oh, no. This does not feel right. This is really scary. I don't know what's down there. And it looks really dark and cold. And I don't know if this thing in my mouth is going to work, if I can breathe through it. And just as I was composing in my head what I was going to say to my grandfather to call this whole thing off, he came up next to me, kind of patted me on the shoulder, and pushed me in. <laughs> so I'm there treading water, kind of taking my tentative breaths with the regulator. And lo and behold, it worked. I could breathe underwater. And I took a second breath, and it worked. I took a third, and I started swimming down, because now I was just curious to see what was down there. And when I got to about 
10 meters, um, there was a school of s small silver fish that started swimming over to me. And I could see the light shining off of their bodies and glinting as they moved in unison. They kind of came around me, and I could push my hand out, and they'd swim away. And then if I brought my hand back, they'd kind of come back. And, and then they were gone. They just kind of moved around me for a moment and were gone. But in that moment, I realized what my grandfather had discovered and had fallen in love with and had wanted to share with the world. And um, for me, it was a transformative moment that connected me to the ocean forever. But that was in the early 80s. And what I didn't realize at that time was that the oceans were about to change dramatically and irreversibly from what my grandfather had discovered in the 50s. And my grandfather worked with this man to create the regulator, Emile Gagnon. And uh, they invented this device together because my grandfather, after World War II, at a time when the environment wasn't at all on anyone's mind, it was still abundant, it was still pristine, and people really took it for granted. The ocean seemed infinite, able to absorb all of our waste without a problem. But my grandfather wanted to go deeper and stay longer, and he was a storyteller. So he wanted to bring those images back to people. And in order to do that, he needed the equipment to get there. And since nobody had invented it before, he had to do it himself. But again, he, had, he didn't have conservation on his mind. He wanted to explore, and he wanted to bring that back. Over the course of several decades, he took people all over the world through their television sets to discover new places, places that people had never seen. And people all over the world fell in love with those images because of the abundance that they saw there. And he taught my father to dive when my father was three. <laughs> um, and, and my father grew up traveling with my, my grandfather on school vacations and falling in love with the oceans as well. But as an adult, my father started to realize that there were changes happening that the places that he had known, that he had seen, that he had fallen in love with, were changing. And it was him and his cohorts in that generation that started thinking about conservation, the idea that what we have is so precious that we should preserve it, we should protect it, we should ensure that we don't destroy it. That beginning of the conservation movement, which has had many successes um, over the years, and I think has done a lot of really important work to protect some of our most precious resources. He instilled that in me. And, uh, and I grew up thinking about conservation. And um, my, first, my first conservation effort was uh, when I was 12. My grandfather had this big petition that he was working on to protect Antarctica from mining. Because at the time, because Antarctica belongs to everybody, companies were vying to go in and dig it up and mine it. And uh, my grandfather believed that it should remain pristine for all of us to enjoy and for future generations to have access to. And so he, he worked really hard, and he was ultimately successful. And um, I like to think that the 289 signatures I got for his petition helped contribute to his success. Um, but conservation was on my mind growing up. But as, as an adult, I've realized that the places I knew as a child have mostly disappeared. Those places that shaped my understanding of the natural world and taught me about the importance of protecting what we have, making a place for nature, making a place for creatures to be able to live in a clean environment and do all the things that they do that contribute to our quality of life here on the planet isn't enough. Conservation isn't enough. Protecting what we have left isn't enough because we don't have enough left. Conservation has become insufficient to what we need to do. You may have heard about these scary statistics about how by 2050 there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. 
that there is a big plastic gyre in the North Pacific that's accumulating plastic. It's not just in the North Pacific, it's in every ocean in the world. And it's not big pieces of plastic floating at the surface. Some scientists describe it as a plastic smog that is choking the oceans and the creatures that live there. It's everywhere now. It's on every beach. It's everywhere. But we also have dead zones that are spreading around the world. And, and the more concentrated our society is, where it touches the ocean, the deader the ocean is. That's a bad sign. Um, so these are some of the big things that we need to solve. Um, and I think about it in the context of my children, because you think, wow, OK, so we've come to this point now. From my grandfather through my father to me, this is where we are. And what do we do? What do we do for our children? Because by 2050, my daughter will be my age. A hundred years separates her from my grandfather. In a hundred years, we took a pristine, ocean and turned it into a trash heap. When my daughter was born seven years ago, I thought about this a lot. I thought about the story of my family and what I would tell her, right? What do I tell her? That the world that she's come into, this family that she's come into, that our job now is to write the obituaries for the ocean? Is that what we will do? Or is there a different future that we can imagine? I realized that the future is not written. No one knows what's going to happen. We don't know that by 2050 there'll be more plastic than fish. That is just the trend. That is what will happen if we do nothing. The future isn't written. And, and the future is an extension of what we do today. That's all it is. What we choose to do today writes the future that we inhabit. So I decided I wanted to tell my children a different story. I wanted to promise her that the ocean that she will grow into will be more abundant than it is today. That rather than simply conserve what's left, we can restore and rebuild our oceans. We can restore and rebuild our natural environment. We can bring it back. And with it, we can increase the health and the happiness and the prosperity of our own communities. So how do we do that? Well, actually, we can do it. The work that I do with Oceana as a senior advisor, we've looked at the countries that fish more than others. And we've realized that 28 countries plus the EU is responsible for 90% of fishing, which is really good news because it means that we don't have to lobby 120 countries to stop overfishing. That we can work to change policies in 28 countries plus the EU and have an outsized impact on what's happening in the oceans. The plastic debris that we find in the oceans the vast majority comes from 10 rivers in Asia. If we can work with those governments and address that source of pollution, we can have an outsized impact on how much plastic is actually flowing into the oceans. And that's not to say that we don't have to take care of what we do at home, but it is to say that there are ways that we can tackle this. And I think that you know, when, when you look at the 60s and 70s, and the work that people did to save the whales, whales that had been decimated by whaling and um, other negative impacts, we were incredibly successful. Whales are coming back. It's, it's an environmental success story, not of conservation, but restoration of a species, of a number of species in the ocean. And people got involved in that even though they'd never seen a whale in the wild, even though they'd never touched a whale or seen a whale, they felt that it was the right thing to do. They didn't want to live in a world that had no whales, and so they got involved in helping to protect them. And I feel like right now we are at a moment when the oceans, and more specifically plastics, are getting that kind of attention and creating that kind of momentum and energy 
and um, it gives me a lot of hope that we can come together at this point and address those issues. Because what we want, again, is not just simply to protect what's left, but to restore what we once had. And while the oceans will never be the same oceans that my grandfather knew in the 50s and 60s, they can be more abundant than they are today. We could feed twice as many people with abundant oceans than we do today. There are endless reasons for us to do this. The Potomac River is a great example of a river that, if you can imagine, used to catch on fire. It used to catch on fire. Like lawmakers could literally look out their windows and see it burning. It's hard to imagine today because we put in legislation that largely fixed that problem. Um, landowners started landscaping differently. Um, conservation groups got on the river, water keepers and others, to fix these problems. And the river is getting better and better and better every year. But it's not just the river that's getting better. Where the river touches the ocean is also positively impacted. And so rivers are actually a wonderful way to get involved in helping to protect our oceans because everything we put down the drain flows into our rivers and out to the sea, which is how we get dead zones in the first place. Engaging with our natural spaces is really important as well. Being able to go out and enjoy them, spend time on them, touch them, share them with your friends and your children is one of the ways that we remember the connection that we have with these places and that we're reminded why we need to protect them and we can find other people to protect them with. The other thing though that I wanted to mention is the importance of women and girls in this movement. We often talk about STEM education and getting more girls involved in STEM, getting more women involved in science. And that isn't just because it feels like the right thing to do or it's more fair that women have equal opportunity to access these fields. But we need women and girls in these fields. We share this planet equally and we have different perspectives on what's important and what solutions can be and how to address these problems. Women have a contribution to make that men don't make and vice versa. And so we need to fix this together. And one of the, one of the anecdotal stories that I heard, but which really struck me, was um, by a woman who works with girls in high school to get them to code. And she found that she couldn't get girls to feel interested in coding unless she introduced purpose to the outcome of the code. And when she did that, girls started getting involved. They started wanting to learn to code because they wanted to have a positive impact through coding on the issues that they cared about. And that's something that we need to remember is that being an environmentalist isn't a job description, right? We need everybody to bring their own special talents to the table, veterinarians, lawyers, everybody has a role to play in this. And um, women and girls have as much of a role to play in this as men especially when there's been a disaster. The Women of the Storm, the Coalition to Restore the Gulf Coast, happened after the oil spill in the Gulf and was one of the key ways that women got their communities involved to rebuild and heal after that disaster. Finally, I, with the time that I have left, I just want to talk about what we can do. And I think it's wonderful that Capital One has this program, Green Solutions. Um, there is a lot of talk about single-use plastics, plastic straws, single-use plastic bags. Um, it's not just idle chatter. When you think that you use these things for 15 seconds or a minute or two minutes, but they persist in our environment for a thousand years, you realize that there's got to be a better way. And it goes beyond just straws. Straws are a wonderful symbol but there's a lot more to it. Sustainable seafood um, is a really wonderful way to make sure that your family is getting healthy fish that have been fished sustainably, that haven't been fished by pirates, that haven't 
degraded the natural environment. MSC certified, there's apps that you can find that will guide you towards seafood that is more sustainable. I think that everything that you put down your drain is ending up in the ocean. The way that we recycle is also having an impact on our environment. Getting involved with things at work, things in your community. Friends of mine started a watershed restoration group in Canada. And she did it because she didn't like seeing trash in her local watershed. But the more she worked on this, the more people came and worked on it with her. And she made friends that she never would have made if she hadn't have gotten involved. So communities are springing up around the world to address problems together that are meaningful and, and have a profound impact on their life. I think that when we, th when we consider that everything we do makes a difference, the future is an extension of what we do today. And that restoring an abundant world for our children is aligned with what we all want to live in. I was um, struck when I was in um, Vermont. I was six months pregnant with my second child. We were doing a program about um, the blue-green algae that's growing in Lake Champlain. And the dairy farmers that have been working really hard to make sure that their farms aren't contributing the nutrients that are creating these blue-green algae blooms. And so I was um, interviewing this dairy farmer who had gone through this whole process to make his farm organic, to prevent his cows from contributing nutrients to the river that led to Lake Champlain. He'd done all of this work. And he'd gotten support from subsidies from the local government and nonprofit groups and volunteers by the hundreds that came and helped him change his farm. And he showed me all of this. And I asked him at the end of the day, I said, so how does all of this make you feel? And he looked at me and he said, I feel amazing. Because for the first time in my life, my beliefs and my actions are aligned. And I feel like I'm leaving a better world to my children, certainly a better farm for my children. So I thought that was a lovely thought, and I went home, I had my baby, and um, a few months later I was hosting a documentary for National Geographic. Uh, it took me to look at organic cotton in Madhya Pradesh in India, which is a very rural part of India. They don't often see people that look like me. They, um, they are humble people. They have a f small plots and they grow cotton. And this one farmer that I talked to through an interpreter um, was showing me all of the changes that he'd made to his farm by going organic. He didn't have to buy um, chemicals to spray on his cotton, which was making his family sick. He had been able to save money from not buying those chemicals and put it aside. And he would put a, a year's um, worth of revenue into a savings account. His children were going to private school. There was his, his neighbors admired him. There was just all of this positive outcome to these changes that he made. And at the end of it, I asked him, I said, so how does all of this make you feel? Can you guess what he said to me? He said, I feel wonderful because for the first time in my life, my choices are aligned with the things that I believe in and I feel like I'm leaving a better place for my children. And it reminded me that we have so much more in common than what separates us. And these fundamental ideas about aligning our actions with our beliefs and feeling that we are treading lightly upon this world and leaving it better than we found it isn't a Western idea, nor is it an idea that rich people have. It's, it's an idea that unites us. And what we need right now is to have a vision of where we want to go. And when I was seven years old, eight years old, we um, went skiing in the Alps. It was like one of the only times <laughs> I've ever gone skiing. It was really fun. And I had a very good looking Italian ski instructor with this red jacket. I'll never forget it. And, um, and uh, I, I might have been seven years old, but I wasn't blind. <laughs> And um, so I listened when he talked. And he took me to the top of the bunny slope and he said, okay, Alexandra, don't look at the trees. Because if you look at the trees, you'll ski into them. 
Look where you want to end up. Look ahead of you. Look where your destination lies. And that's how you get there. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like today, in our public discourse, we are only talking about the trees. How big they are, how far they are, or whether there's any trees at all. When what we need to be talking about is where we want to go together and how we're going to get there. Do we want our children to come of age in a world where there's more plastic in the oceans than fish? Or do we want to have a vision of abundance that we can work towards and realize that we all are part of it? And these are the things that I think about. I invite you to think about them with me because these are some of the really important questions and questions that we need to answer. I see my family legacy as a book with three chapters. My grandfather's chapter was about exploration, discovering a world of wonder and awe that he invited everybody to see with him. My father's chapter was about realizing that these things are precious and fragile, and that we could lose them if we're not careful. And sadly, we weren't careful. There was a time when we could have turned back the clock and restored abundance to what it was before. I don't think we'll ever get there. There was a time we could have prevented climate change, and that ship has sailed as well. So the future that we're looking at is very different from the past that we've known. And this is chapter three. What is chapter three going to be about? And what do we tell our children when they come of age? Do we tell them, sorry guys, we didn't do enough? We didn't do it in time? We were distracted with iPhones and gadgets and screens and stuff we wanted to buy and we didn't pay attention? Or do we tell them that we came together and restored the world that we passed on to them? We're very busy saving money for college funds. We're not busy enough thinking about the world that they will go to college in. But it's not too late. There are a lot of people working on solutions and working to restore abundance. But that has to be our narrative. And we have to write this third chapter together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, our next speaker. A uh, few of you may have grown up seeing him on television, usually with a few furry, feathered, four-legged friends. Uh, Jeff Corwin uh, is an internationally known wildlife conservationist, environmental journalist. He has a television career spanning two decades as a host and a producer of such shows as Jeff Corwin Experience on the Animal Planet. His work has been internationally recognized. He is a winner of three Emmy Awards. He's an, oh, sorry, four. <laughs> four. <laughs> He's an author and a documentarian. Uh, work 100 Heartbeats introduces audiences to the most endangered species on our planet. So with that, please welcome Jeff Corwin to the stage. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to you guys at Capital One for this invitation. I always really uh, take stock of moments where the corporate community can interact with the conservation community as we all strive towards a common mission, as Alexandra touched upon, which is about securing the future for our children. She illustrated that really beautifully in the idea of three chapters. And like her, we're sort of in that same time where we have young families. And as people who've traveled the world and have seen the world, we are witness to the challenges that we face. And I'm always sort of taken aback at my life today, and I get to be with you today and share these thoughts with you. I just flew in from a shoot in Portugal day before yesterday. 
I'm testifying uh, to Congress. I go home, got to talk to Congress on Thursday about how our government and our president's administration is going to work to eliminate the education information lock in television programming and how that's not a good thing for our children and it certainly won't be good for my mortgage to pay the bills. Um, and uh, then I'm off to Sydney and I think, wow, I have got to a point where I get to live a big passion of mine, which is connecting to nature, outdoors, and wildlife. And I think of your grandfather's history and, and his legacy, and I've had a chance to work with your brother, became friends, and I thought, this is the kid who grew up in the inner city, as we say in Boston, grew up in a triple decker. My dad was a Boston cop, my mom was a nurse, and there wasn't a lot of nature. The only time I saw or connected to nature is when we visited someone who lived in the country. And one day we were visiting my grandparents. They lived in Middleborough, Massachusetts, sort of rural area, not much different than you'd see outside of DC. They lived in a big manufactured home, not that big. And one day I was in the backyard and I saw this creature that I'd never seen before. It was about this long and it was legless and it was scaly. And as all children do in your wonderful selfish world, I thought I was the first person ever to discover this creature. But lo and behold, the moment I discovered the serpent, it disappeared. It untwisted like a turban and just kind of melted into the stack of wood. I feverishly ripped through the wood trying to get to this creature to show the world that it really existed like an alien from another planet. And finally, I got to that layer, the kind of gross layer in a wood pile that no one ever takes the wood. It's all spongy and little tendrils of, 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 of white roots and wisps of forgotten cocoons and spider webs. And there it was, perfectly coiled, a goddard snake. I didn't even know what it was, but I knew I had to show people about it. But the moment I found that snake, it began to slither off. So instinctively, I reached out and grabbed onto it. I was six. And it instinctively reached back and grabbed onto me. And I walked into the double wide and my grandmother, Chicky, sitting in her, her big uh, easy chair. She's got a fresca in one hand and a palm oil in the other. She looks at me. She goes, get rid of it. But deeper, I think, a little. I said, no. She said, why not? I said, because I love it. Now get it off my arm. So my dad pried this poor snake off my arm. and We liberated it back to the woodpile. And that was my introduction to nature. That was the lightning bolt that hit me at six years old. I knew that for the rest of my life, I would have a connection to nature. I did not know how it would manifest itself specifically but I knew that I would work with animals some way, somehow. And if you know anything about snakes, they are the ultimate creature of habit. So I developed a truce with the snake who I named Gladys. And for two years, I observed Gladys. I would just relish the time I could go see my grandparents and visit that little corner lot that they had and see Gladys out basking. I learned about photography. I started doing sketches. I learned about ecdysis, watching her shed her skin and with this beautiful, lustrous skin underneath. And I learned about defense when she ate a nasty slug and repelled it from her mouth. I learned at the ripe old age of probably seven about reproduction, watching her move through the leaf litter and seeing all these curious heads pop up around her until they twisted into a breeding ball. She had literally laid out pheromones through the leaf litter, drawing in these male snakes from an acre away to sire with her. And that most tenacious, determined snake that wove through the maelstrom of snaky bodies and connected with her, that was it. And once he had passed on his genetic material, she literally produced 
chemicals of repulsion to drive the other snakes away. Not all that different to a human relationship in its own special way. But I learned so much about nature and life from Gladys. She was my gateway drug to nature. And I often think if I turned over a log and found a guitar, maybe it'd have been a rock star. Or if I found a golf club, maybe it'd have been a Tiger Woods or a serial killer or something, I don't know. But I found this snake. And, uh, and this was the day I became a naturalist. The day I became a conservationist, I was eight years old. And it was about late August, and she was ripe with babies. And my dream was to watch her have her live birth. So I was watching her there. I had a Polaroid camera, taking pictures. And then all of a sudden, there was chaos. And Gladys's mouth was reaching out and sort of biting at the air, while the back part of her just sort of pathetically twisted about. And then she stopped biting at the air, and it was like the movie The Terminator. The life in her eyes, you know, just went away. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? And my viewpoint expanded to see my grandparents' next door neighbor with a spade in his hand. And he had decapitated and dispatched Gladys. And that was the day I became a conservationist. And that was the day I realized good people make bad decisions because they lack information. And that sent me on my course to somehow find my way onto television and to somehow find my way with you today to have 22 minutes to share what I feel is the most powerful argument on the planet today that could very well determine the survival of your children or at least the quality of their life. We live in unprecedented times. If anything has taught us about our politics today, it is remarkably and shockingly unprecedented where we find ourselves, especially with the state of life on Earth. Extinction is not new. Species have been ebbing and flowing since species began. Today, if you went in the ocean, there's 400 something species of sharks. If you were Back in these oceans 120 million years ago, there was thousands of different shark species. So nature comes and goes. But the difference is we are the catalyst of extinction. The asteroid wiping out life is us. And I've often thought, how do I distill it in a way that it makes sense? I wrote a book a, a few years ago called, eight years ago called 100 Heartbeats. And it was about this idea of a time where we would live in a world where we would have incredibly, not just innocuous creatures that you don't understand their value, doesn't mean it isn't value, but charismatic, iconic species that have been pushed to the brink where we would have 100 individuals or less. And it was based on a paper I read by E.O. Wilson when I was in college in the late 80s, and I thought this would never happen. E.O. Wilson, for, who, for those who don't know, is the greatest naturalist living on our planet today. And I was very fortunate that he actually wrote the foreword for my book based on a paper that I wrote of this sort of come to Jesus moment of here we are, where we have a plethora of species, where we have just a few hundred individuals of, or less. And I looked at it as a drama. Who gets to stay? Who gets to go? Who determines? Who survives? What do we lo lose aesthetically, biologically, culturally, ecologically when these species tip into the precipice? But before we can do that, we have to understand what is the driving fuel behind extinction? And again, Extinction, historically, if you want to use that term, represents a moment where in life you either disappear all at once or you gradually matricula matriculate into something else. You either biologically become a typewriter in the age of animal computers or something environmentally catastrophic happens and you all go away at once. Today, you can look at it in a way that I kind of wrapped my head around it when I was putting that book together. I thought of my favorite book. I love nautical history. I love all that stuff. And I grew up in a, in a community. Uh, uh, we eventually moved to the south shore of Massachusetts. I 
eventually moved to an island. I fell in love with nautical history and especially the whole uh, history of New England fisheries and the lore behind that. And I read a book called A Perfect Storm. I don't know if you've ever read that book by Sebastian Unger. And it's a great book. It's a shitty movie, but it's a great book. <laughs> and um, in the book, he basically talks about this boat, this fishing boat heading to the banks called the Andrea Gale. And as it heads out, it encounters a perfect storm. Not perfect in its beauty and its elegance and its loveliness, perfect in its lethality because unbeknownst to them, the environment had conspired. They went out there in a time of year where if you hit that water, you have an hour to survive. Because of that time of the year and the lunar cycle, it was a giant moon and they had a giant 13 foot plus tide to deal with. Then when you threw in this nor'easter with 100 plus mile an hour winds, probably more than that, it all mixed together to create a perfect storm in lethality, a storm that you could not survive. And that is how I looked at extinction. So what are the elements of the perfect extinction storm? They are climate change, habitat loss, environmental degradation, as was alluded to with plastics, arguably one of the greatest challenges we face in our planet today, plastics. The black market wildlife of trade, 20 billion dollar year industry. The black market wildlife trade is only matched by narcotics and arms trade. And then human population growth. The ugly stepchild we never want to talk about because it just derails conversations. But what happens when our population grows to that point beyond the carrying capacity of our planet? Well, all of them on their own are pretty terrible to the wildlife of our planet. But incredibly, they do not work independently. They conspire with each other and feed each other. So you go to Indonesia, Sumatra, you go to Borneo, you cut down a pristine rainforest, you take that wildlife, orangutans, this is, this is why there are only uh, less than 700 uh, uh, tigers, not lions, tigers in Southeast Asia because of this practice of scraping and denuding the habitat. You then make that wildlife available for the black market wildlife trade. You then take all that carbon in a natural bank and you release it into the environment contributing to climate change in a very dramatic, instantaneous fashion through burning. And then you then plant a product such as palm oil, which is very unsustainable and very intensive with regard to chemistry on the environment with pesticides and fertilizers. And all of that has worked together. The slashing and burning of that ecosystem of a rainforest, you take that little puzzle piece from Indonesia and you take what happened for soy in Brazil or cattle ranching in Costa Rica and you mix that up, what you do is you scrape off 3,000 acres of rainforest every hour from our planet to provide for these activities. You take palm oil, this product, or pulp, this product being produced, and then you have to ask yourself, who's the culprit? Who's the bad guy? Which is always the big challenge in conservation. There's got to be a bad guy. Well, we're all the bad guy. Because one in every 10 products on a supermarket shelf contains palm oil because it's convenient, it grows fast, and it has multiple uses from frying fish to a stabilizer in ice cream and in cosmetics. It's one example of how this perfect storm works together, which contributes to extinction. We are losing more species today in what is argued to be the sixth extinction as we did 
65, 70 million years ago when all life of significant size was wiped from our planet because of an asteroid. This is a very real clinical problem exemplifying the challenges our planet faces and it sounds overwhelming and academic. And what I wanted to do with you today is to try to put a personal face to it. And I think for a lot of people, maybe you would think of, because of my background and the stuff I've done in television, maybe it'd be snakes or something like that. And I love snakes. But if there was one creature that really connected the dots for me, it would be elephants. The first time I ever saw an elephant, we were filming in Africa. We'd approached this small little area. We were filming some baboons. I crept out of the Range Rover and down, and my cameraman, Pierce, was shooting from the top. We have a very, uh, not always a positive relationship, Pierce. I like a cameraman that's big, strong, heavy cameraman. And Pierce, he was big and strong. He had a big heart. It's probably enlarged now that I think about it, but he's a big guy. So, and we're always kind of playing jokes on each other. So there's one moment, very famous moment, where I'm approaching this uh, cheetah, and actually I'm approaching something else, and there's a cheetah in the bush felt, and it pops up and begins to move towards me, and I'm reminding myself that there's no modern account of an adult being dispatched by a cheetah, and nothing has worked. The keychain thing, you smell my cat at home, is not working. And then Pierce is looking at me, and I'm literally in a panic. I said, he may not kill me, but he's certainly going to hurt me. And he's filming me. And I look over, and I said, uh, help. And he goes, oh, Jeff, you can't unrun that cheater. And I said, no, Pierce, but I can unrun your fat ass. And I ran to the vehicle. <laughs> um, and then a very famous moment in Borneo, we had all these leeches. So, you know, I'm... I thought it would be fun. I'd pick all these leeches, and I would sneak up in Pierce, and I'd put them in his left boot. And that was an interesting little practical joke to play. Um, but we are there in this moment going to film baboons, and I hear this great thundering sound in the background. And that thundering sound explodes to see a giant African elephant coming up. And I remember Roloff, our guide, said, whatever you do, if you charge by an elephant, do not run from that elephant because it'll just have that bully dog moment and just come straight barreling for you. So I remember thinking to myself, don't run, don't run, don't run. And it starts charging out and then it stops. I'm like, whew. And then whoom, it goes right by me. And I look back to see the whole crew running away towards their vehicles. And I'm like, you shouldn't run from an elephant. And they did. And then they got in the vehicle and they took off and left me there. And I'm looking at these baboons, which I'm terrified of now, and they're kind of looking at me like, you're not so tough now, lonely naked ape, what are you going to do? And we eventually got back to the vehicle, and it was this great uh, trying experience. And, and I remember saying when they came back to get me, and I said, were you rolling? And he's like, yeah, it was incredible, it was amazing. I'm like, so we went back, this is when they had videotapes, played the videotape, and you see me, you see some baboons, you see some vegetation explode, and you see like an elephant or a great alien abduction, then you see his giant alley boots running up towards his vehicle, you see a rosary at a glance just waving in a mirror, and that was my first elephant moment. My second elephant moment that was very distinctive was actually the pilot episode for the experience series we did. And that was the one with the leeches. And that's where these leeches, I was more amazed about them than the wildlife. There's, there's nothing more amazing than a leech. It'll sit on the drip tip of a leaf, wait there with the ultimate sense of patience. Then it will take the ultimate leaf, leap of faith, tumble down into your pant leg, pass through your sock, attach to your skin, produce an anesthetic so there's no pain, and an anticoagulant, so you bleed liberally. And this thing that looks like a sharpened number two pencil lead gets to be about four inches and an inch wide with about four ounces of blood. So that's what I was putting in Pierce's poop. Um, so I'm thinking we're never going to see these elephants. Only 45 elephants left in Borneo. We had our guide with us who was a biologist studying them. And then he said, stop and look around. And then we realized that all around us, are these pie plate 
orbits, just glistening, brown eyeballs staring. And the entire herd had been with us the whole time. And of course, that's when all heck broke loose where the elephants started charging us and we had to work our way back from that. And it was also, you learn about weak, weak links in your production crew when Brian, our production assistant, came up, 25-year-old man, so scared of nature, he had duct taped his gloves in his boots to his pants. He had a Ray Bolger scarecrow hat on and a flannel shirt, and it's 100 degrees out. And he comes up to me, and he's been weeping, and he says, I just realized something. And I said, what, Brian? He said, I hate animals. I said, what an odd career choice for you, Brian. <laughs> and he started to cry and get upset, and he wanted a hug. And I said, there's no freaking hug in a make an animal show. <laughs> I said, stop crying. You're acting like the first person to get killed in this bloody horror movie. Now get out of here. So the, the last elephant story I'll tell you about happened a long time ago. And this was, I think, my Disney series I had. And we had, were invited by Daphne Sheldrick, who I got to know, who is an incredible icon in conservation. She just uh, passed recently. Um, and we went to her elephant orphanage. And she was a pioneer in saving elephants, which is the byproduct of the black market wildlife trade, the ivory trade, which right now is the worst that it's been since the 70s, since like people like Idi Amin in a time where our government is now opening up the importation of, of trophy parts from Africa, like tusks and other uh, trophy elements. But we were there to tell this story. And they would save these elephants. You know, elephants live in a, in a matriarchal community with grandmothers, sometimes a great grandmother, and aunts and sisters and cousins. And the guys can hang around until they get to puberty and they're on their own. And um, when an elephant, if you want to take out a lot of ivory, go for the babies, because the moms and the cousins will come in and rally behind it, and you'll have an incredible harvest, because that's the way you do it. But they would just leave these babies there. She would salvage these babies. And first, they needed to figure out the formula. They had an unacceptable amount of mortality until they figured out the right formula. But then they still were losing like 15% of their elephants. Until one day, I forget if there was either a storm or a fire, and everyone had to sleep together, all the baby elephants and the people. And it was the first morning where no one was sick. And they realized mother's love is what these little babies need. So then they started having the caregivers sleep with these animals at night. So that was our story. It was gonna be the ultimate slumber party. And there I have Raji. She's a, he was three months old, three months old, about 700 pounds. We're in this scratchy straw and scratchy wool blanket. And I'm like, this kid from the triple decker is having the ultimate slumber party with an elephant. And we're just about to go to sleep and we're there and I kind of close that out to the camera. This was before we had GoPros and stuff like that. And I'm really like an hour in, I'm like so conflicted. It's a very contrary situation because half of me is like, oh my God, I am being spooned by an elephant. <laughs> and the other half was like, oh my God, I'm having a stroke because she's so big or he's so big by this giant elephant. And in the middle of the night, after we both had kind of fallen asleep, I woke up to this pain, this pounding. And Raji was having a nightmare. I was getting up and wielding around. I didn't realize this until I had my own dogs, and my dogs would have little dreams, and you'd see. And I didn't know what to do. I wasn't a dad at the time, so I was instinctively reaching up and trying to cover the elephant's eyes and stroking its ear. And I finally pulled it in, and I just kind of went, shh. It's okay, and I whispered into its ear, and it fell asleep. And right before it fell asleep, its trunk went up and grabbed my hair and started twisting it into a lock. And it was an incredible moment that I forgot all about. I have a lot of cool moments in my life doing this job. I kind of forgot about it until one day, many years later, 
my wife, who had just finished her PhD and just had a baby, I thought I could do something intense. And I remember she was nine months pregnant and she had to defend her PhD and she was so terrified and she said, I, gotta, I can't even sit with my sciatica and I have to sit at a table with five old men and defend my life's work. And I said, well, if you don't like where it's going, honey, bring a water balloon and drop it between your legs <laughs> and you'll get your PhD. <laughs> she didn't have to do that. Um, but so my wife, Natasha's like, so I'm going to go out with my girlfriends. Jeff, there's two things that need to happen. When I come home, there will not be an ambulance here or a fire truck. I'm like, I can pull that off. So she goes on out. I'm sleeping, watching TV, getting kind of bored. So I go check on Maya. At the time, she's seven months old. She's beautifully coiled like a little viper in her bed. I reach in there, and I'm like, God, oh, she's awfully quiet. Maya? Maya? Maya! And she wasn't. She was awake. So eyes looking up at me, and I pick her up, and I bring her to the living room and put her on the couch. And She's not sitting very well on that couch, and holding her head, and I'm like, I'll be right back, Hannibal Lecter, Maya Corwin, that's not his face. And then I run in, and I hear this thud. Thank God my wife wasn't home. And somehow she fell on the floor. I don't know how that happened. And she's screaming. So I pick her up, and I shake her. That doesn't work. Don't do that. But I hold her. I'm rocking her back and forth. She starts to settle down. And then right before she kind of cuddles up and goes to sleep, she grabbed my hair and twisted it into a lock. And that whole elephant moment with Raji came back. And I realized I became a naturalist because I was fascinated by nature. I became a conservationist because I was worried about nature and worried about animals. But I now was a conservationist, as it was alluded to, because of my child. Because what kind of world will she inherit? We live in an incredibly dark time in conservation. Many of the things we have pursued and achieved in just under two months have been washed away. We are forgetting our place as the world stewards of protecting nature and landscape, as leaders in wildlife. But as you get pulled down into this ball, you have to remember the incredible things we've done. If you were here, as was mentioned in the Chesapeake in the 1970s, you didn't see bald eagles. Why? Because there was only 400 pair for the entire lower 48. One pair for the state of New York. Today, there's over 20,000 pair. We recovered bald eagles. Osprey have recovered. Alligators, you get the bald eagle, it's a symbol of our country. But alligators, well, alligators were on the brink of extinction. We brought them back because we recognized their value. Yeah, if you were like in Chafalaya Swamp in an inner tube and you were rednecking the Sunday away with a cold beverage and an anvil-sized alligator head bubbled up next to you, you'd be scared, and you should be because you're about to die. <laughs> but we see beyond that biological conflict, and we recovered this species instrumental to wildlife. Lastly, have you ever heard of a black-footed ferret? The black-footed ferret became extinct. Book closed. I filmed them at a moment of recovery because back in the late 70s, a scientist found a, a, a rancher found a dead black-footed ferret in his doorstep. And out of that, they went and found the last surviving colony, the lost colony of black-footed ferrets, a hundred of them. But as luck would have it, they were exposed to distemper and probably plague, and that within two days, only 12 or 11 survived. I filmed them in the early 90s. Wasn't looking good. Cut back to Maya, that same kid I almost brain injured, at my side at the age of four with 14 cages, opened them up. 14 black-footed ferrets went into a prairie dog town. And the prairie dog said, why did you do that? Because they're going to eat us. 14 black-footed ferrets of 2,000 ferrets living in the wild today, the ultimate Lazarus of nature. My point is, even at the darkest time, there is hope. 
And what drives our hope is our children. And we must see through the trees to find the finish line. And if we want the ultimate solution, it lies in our children. But it lies with the connection because you can't protect what you do not love. You will never love it if you never get to meet it and learn its backstory, which is our responsibility as parents. Because in the end, all of this, we didn't inherit from our ancestors. We borrowed it from those very children. Thank you very much. Big round of applause to Jeff Corum, please. Thank you. We'd like to bring Alexander back up on stage. All right. So I'll start off with the first question, and we'll start with you. Uh, in your career, what, um, what have you seen change in the most past couple of years that has surprised you the most? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, th there's, you have to find balance between hope and despair. Mm -hmm a lot of what you see is profoundly despairing. And then um, there are reasons to have great hope. And I think one of the really exciting things that I've been a part of um, is uh, with Oceana, a project called Save the Oceans, Feed the World. And this is based on a lot of research that was done looking at, as I mentioned in my talk, you know, what countries have the biggest share of fishing, and then how can you know, we change the outcome of their fishing practices? So the, the big problem, the reason that we may have more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050 isn't just that we're pushing plastic into the ocean as fast as we possibly can, which we are, but it's also we're taking fish out of the ocean as fast as we possibly can. So that's a pretty easy equation. We realize, though, that those 28 countries plus the EU um, if we can get them to listen to scientists when they're setting quotas and expand marine protected areas so fish have habitat in which to reproduce and, and live, um, and if we can reduce bycatch, so bycatch is all of the species that are caught with the target species that are then thrown overboard. So for some species like shrimp, it can be every pound of shrimp, it can be 10 pounds or more of bycatch. 3,000 year old corals, sea turtles, things like that. Um, so if we're able to do those three things in these countries, we can see a measurable return of fish mm -hmm. abundance. And, uh, and that's a really good thing, because not just because we want fish in the ocean, um, but because we can feed up to a billion people a, a seafood meal a day. We can restore food security. We can, um, it has a positive impact on political security. It just so much depends on abundance in our oceans. And um, we don't realize that. When, when we choose the fish we eat, um, we always pick the same 12, mm -hmm. when there's actually over 700 species in the United States that are not only edible, but delicious. So there's a lot that we can do um, on that issue, and, and I feel really excited to be part of it, because I feel like that's actually something that we could solve. Right on. Jeff, same question to you. What have you seen change in the past several years that surprised you the most? Well, I think I've seen similar things with regard to incredible success and incredible failure. Um, so, for example, success, I've, I've been there to see species recovery, and that's pretty amazing, and have my kids be a part of that story. Um, failure, uh, I've seen species fall to extinction. I did it, I've seen, I always, I, as I discussed with my kids, I've seen extinction and high definition television. You know, with, especially I did a documentary on amphibian extinction which is a huge problem when you have kind of the ultimate indicator species of nature, amphibians, living on this planet for 350 million years, when we've lost half of them species in a six-year window, um, it tells you that this canary in the coal mine is, has, has an interesting and uh, foreboding tale to tell. So I, I, think for, I think for me, those moments where we've seen recovery is very, very exciting. I know where I live, and we were talking about this earlier, I live in a, in a, uh, off of the coast of New England where incredible amount of funds had to go in to restore that ecosystem. And very strong regulations and what fish you can take, how many you can take, and enforcement. And that has allowed a really remarkable recovery. In, in some areas, our waters are healthier than they were 
100 years ago when there were mills and other things occurring there. I also have seen a tremendous change in attitude. For example, you know, my passion was always about getting people to appreciate snakes. And I noticed that people, when you look at bats and snakes and other animals, people have a better attitude about these creatures and are more less falling prey to what I call charismatic species syndrome. Everyone wants to save a panda or a tiger. But who says that biological species is any more valuable than anything else? Everything has its place. So that's kind of how I look at where um, I've seen positive negative changes. Politically, I will have to say, I have never seen anything like we are experiencing today. And I think it's very important for everyone to know that historically, America was not focused where politics rendered whether we protected something or not. You can find great heroes of conservation that were Republicans and Democrats. You know, Richard Nixon, not our most beloved president, but you wouldn't have bald eagles without Richard Nixon. You wouldn't have clean air and clean water. You wouldn't have all the, you wouldn't have the, uh, uh, the EPA would not exist if it wasn't for this man. Teddy Roosevelt um, was a bit brute in some of the things he did, but helped create our whole way of we look at our landscape. And then when you look at where we are today, and it's quite shocking to where we've come, we were the leaders at the table. I mean, literally, we were the leader at the climate change table. We've stepped away. And who took our chair at that place? Uh, Syria. Literally took, sat down. And apparently, they have more to offer than we do now when it comes to that sort of stuff. That, to me, I find very, very terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Royal, do we have any questions from online? Um, this was uh, for Alexandra. So uh, the question was, recently we've seen parts of the Arctic Sea made passable by climate change. As an explorer and a conservationist, uh, what are your thoughts on the opportunities versus dangers in that development? Oh, that's, uh, that's a big issue that people are just really now starting to wrap their head around. I was in Halifax for the G7 ministerial meetings last week, and um, honestly, there's so much that's happening right now in the Arctic. I mean, it's not just that it's passable by ships, um, that companies are wanting to go in and drill, which is like the worst idea ever, um, or that, you know, polar bears' days are numbered because their environment is literally melting up from under them. But, you know, when you look at the fish, they are moving towards the Arctic. And so they're passing from one country's exclusive economic zone to another, which means that legislation isn't in place for them, that their fishing industry may not be there to exploit them um, legally, which opens it up to illegal fisheries. So I, there's just so much happening in the Arctic, and it feels a little bit like the Wild West. Um, and we have a lot to figure out because that environment's changing extremely quickly, and uh, there's, a, there's a huge ingenuity gap between where we are now um, and what's happening in the environment and what we need to put in place to make sure that however that environment is changing, there are measures in place to make sure that it, isn't, um, it doesn't fall victim to rapacious greed. <laughs> and, um, and on that note, Antarctica is going to be, you know, the, the treaty's ending soon, in the next uh, 20 years or so. So there's going to be a lot of players that are going to be moving in to try to ensure that we don't renew that treaty, that we open up Antarctica to mining and stuff. And uh, we need to decide whether or not that's an environment that's worth protect, continuing to protect or whether we can just go ahead and Let it go. exploit it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, anybody from the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to stand up and someone can get to you with a microphone. One over there. Go ahead and stand up, sir. I watched a show on television years ago. It was about coral reef. And there was a, some type of koi fish that was killing all the other reef fish. And that they were saying that the coral reefs were disappearing. Is that still in play as they were showing like the red areas just going up the coast of the coral reefs disappearing because of a specific type of fish? No one would eat. Lionfish? Yeah, maybe you're talking about lionfish. Lionfish don't necessarily impact a coral reef, but 
lionfish are a very powerful, highly uh, defensed species of fish, originally from uh, the South Pacific, places like uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Australasia. It, it's barbed with basically syringes coming out of its fins. And one theory is, a NOAA theory, is that you can, there's now millions and millions, if not billions of them living from southern New York all the way down to Bonaire. And they can trace them back genetically to six fish that were released probably around the time of Hurricane Andrew from an Aquarius type environment off the coast of Florida. Uh, and in one day, a lionfish eats 50% of its body weight. Um, so that I, I worked with the Smithsonian scientists that actually discovered a new species of fish inside the stomach of a lionfish. So it's an incredible, incredible challenge, but it's a great example of changes in culture. So there's now a, an, an effort to use this as a resource. So people are hunting them, they're eating them. I've hunted them and I've eaten them and they taste delicious. You can eat them as ceviche, you can fry the whole thing. You fry the whole lionfish, it's all nice and crispy and the, and the, the, the syringes crisp up so they're not poisonous anymore. So, um, so and, and actually I went to an area that I filmed six years ago where there were lionfish everywhere and because of this program there was a significant reduction. The problem is, is they've gone deeper. So we went down in an ROV, we found them at almost 1,000 feet deep, thriving. So, and I think probably the other thing would probably be maybe coral, coral bleaching or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You want to talk about that? I mean, yeah, I think one of the, one of the biggest threats to corals um, is coral bleaching and climate change. There's predictions that all of our corals could be gone by 2030. Um, and you know, in my experience, the really abundant reefs are so few and far between that it's almost like visiting a museum. I've gone to reefs like Palau, Micronesia, uh, Australia, where I did my graduate work in Central America. I just returned back after 20 years. It does not look the same. Yeah. It looks, looks sad. Yeah. It just looks like it's depressed. Uh, it's just gray and the, the vividity isn't there. And of course you get these great swaths of bleaching. And Australia, the Great Barrier Reef is in a tremendous amount of trouble. And these are the nurseries for our planet's oceans. So there's an interesting um, idea uh, out of Saudi Arabia because the corals of the Red Sea are actually, um, are able to thrive in much warmer waters than corals in the rest of the world. And they've just developed, they evolved that way because the water there is warmer. And so there's work being done in Saudi Arabia to see if we can't take what, you know, whatever we can, the genetic of, of the Red Sea corals to help corals survive um, in other parts of the world is sort of a last resort to trying to, to keep our corals in different parts of the world. And they are the nurseries of the world. I mean, a lot of pelagic species re require coral reefs as part of their life cycles. And f fisheries depend on coral reefs and mangroves and other areas that are declining dramatically around the world as part of their life cycles. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to figure out how not just to restore these places, but to find a way to help make them more resilient to climate change. I know. We'll probably have time for one or two more questions. Is there anyone over here with a question? Go for it. Stand up. Hey, um, so you had mentioned, Alexander, that, uh, that maybe most of the plastic in the ocean comes out like the same like handful of rivers in Asia and Africa or whatever. Um, so I was wondering, um, it, it's kind of frustrating, I guess, in America. Obviously, we should still do the best that we can, but it doesn't really put a dent in all the stuff that's kind of pouring out of the Yellow River and the Ganges and whatever. So what, I guess, even more specific about what the strategy is there for trying to get those like third world countries to make that a priority to clean up the pollution that's coming from there? There's a lot of talk right now. Um, I have a bit of, uh, you'll forgive my level of frustration on this issue because coming from the G7, everybody was talking about recycling and that's insufficient. Like, it's just not enough. You know, there's efforts to get plastic out of the environment. That's great. Let's get as much as we can out. But cleanups aren't enough. Like, saying that we can solve the plastic problem by cleaning up what's in the environment is like saying we can address climate change by sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. Like, it's just, that's not the right approach. We have to focus on turning off the single-use plastic tap. And that means that we have to change our own behavior. Governments need to legislate differently. 
and companies need to invest in different materials and we have to do it as quickly as possible. It's like single use plastic has got to go. Like it just has to. Um, we survived very well without it until like three, 30 years ago. We can do so again. Like we need to find alternatives. So that's the number one thing. It's, it's we have to stop that. Secondly, um, there's uh, a lot of ways that you know, we can look at preventing plastic trash in rivers from reaching the ocean. There's ways to collect it. Um, it's not that expensive. And, uh, and there's a lot of people working on that. Investing in those solutions and assisting governments that aren't as wealthy as ours are in implementing those is, uh, is going to be part of the solution. And I think setting an example in our own societies, in how our communities deal with waste, the technologies that we bring to scale, the personal commitment that we bring to this issue. Um, don't be trashy. I love it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I think that it's, it's a solution that, that we can implement, but it needs to be played out on a, on a number of different fronts. Uh, yeah, I think that's plastic, I think, is our, one of our biggest challenges we face, especially with microbeads. Mm. People don't realize we are finding areas where microbeads are replacing substrate like sand. And microbeads are in everything. They're in toothpaste. They're in cleansers. And they pass right through any uh, industrial filtration system that's used um, by communities to uh, uh, restore water sources. In our house, we have done everything we can to given up um, the wasteful use of plastics. And it's actually doable. Um, we have a rule. Tin foil's got to be used 20 or 30 times. Uh, we're, we're using ceramics more uh, and no plastic water bottles at all. Uh, and I think if we can make those changes, you think about you can you hydrate yourself for 20 minutes of hydration and it's presented to you in a plastic vessel that could survive 400 plus years in a landfill. Even in countries where there's a lot of mess, it would become a fishing bobber, it becomes a baby bottle, it be, I've seen them used to hold candlesticks. At least they get the multi-use out of necessity. We're so wasteful, we, are, we, we just use things so quickly because we have that, this instantly gratified opportunity. And plastics, I think, are kind of that quintessential lens of that challenge we face. I mean, I think it's great, like the straws, the plastic straws, everybody's making a big deal out of it. Even if we stop, I mean, 500 million straws a day in the United States are used. Like, it's incredible. Cruise ships are eliminating straws, mm -hmm. which is yeah. a big deal. And, and, and a lot of companies and organizations are, are, are doing it. But it's just a great symbol, I think, um, of this thing that we use for a few seconds. It isn't recycled because they're so thin, they fall through the grates of the recycling machines, and um, they they're just, I mean, as, as I see people drink out of their song, I'm like, that's going to last forever. <laughs> like, do you really need it? Or will paper be sufficient? And, and I your think lipstick that's, is still smudged. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's the, the shift mm -hmm. that we need to have mm -hmm. in, in terms of how we view the things that we use and whether or not they're really necessary or if alternatives can be just as good and maybe even better. Very good. Well, thank you both very much for joining us today. It's been excellent. So everybody, please give another round of applause. Thank you. Sit tight for a sec. All right. Um, so as promised, we did have one announcement. We, um, you know, traditionally, we've done the speaker series in the fall. And next year's speaker is going to be joining us a little bit earlier closer to Earth Day. Um, and so with that, I'd like to say that um, Dr. Jane Goodall will be joining us April 18th in McLean. So please uh, keep uh, your calendars open on that day, and uh, we hope that you guys will join us. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Those of you uh, here, please step outside and join us uh, for the reception with Jeff and Alexandra. Thank you very much.